comes from Jenna Preston, uh, Prestoninsky at the Detroit Free Press. We all love to go to our state parks, but soon it may cost those of us that uh, get those passes for the entire year with our registration a little bit more chatter to do so. For the first time in three years, the, cent, the state uh, is increasing the price of its recreation passport. However, the jump isn't going to be too severe or too taxing on your wallet as it only is going up about a dollar from $12 to now 13 the passport, of course, provides unlimited entry to state parks as part of the program introduced by the DNR in 2010, giving Michiganders like you and I a chance to explore our beautiful Michigan landscapes and have fun in its recreation areas without extra stoppages and a consistent cost of entry. Now look, not everyone's going to have an extra $13 to put down every year for their registration costs to get the recreation passport, so if the price increase is too much, why not explore your local parks? Look, there's plenty of amazing places right in our backyards here in southeastern Michigan and in Oakland County. In fact, just some of them uh, off the top of my head from down uh, are those like down the road from us here at our flagship at Civic Center TV. Places like Drake Sports Park, a great place to go if you like to play uh, baseball, if you like to run around the fields, maybe some soccer, and certainly for those of you that have become big pi pickleball aficionados over the last couple of years as that sport has boomed across the U.S. That's a great place to go. And another one here in West Bloomfield that a lot of people love to go to is Marsh Bank Park with beautiful open landscapes and plenty of other activities also available. There's so many parks, not just in West Bloomfield, but across Oakland County and around Southeast Michigan that you can explore with whether you're going there for certain activities, just a calm day out in nature, or you know, going for a walk through the woods. You don't necessarily have to go out of your way to go to a state park or to go to a national park to see great landscapes right here in the state of Michigan and to have some fun outdoors. You can go to your local township, your local city, your local village and their parks as well and then enjoy the outdoors right in your hometown. Usually your city, your township, or your village website will have some information uh, if you need to learn more about where your parks are. And many of these parks are free for anyone, resident or not, to go and use. So while it's sunny and it's warm here in February, somehow, some way, feeling like it's the middle of April, it's a great time to go outside and you know, have some fun in your local parks with your family and your friends and meet some of your neighbors as well. I highly encourage you to do that uh, as the, the Recreation Passport here in Michigan. Going up a dollar in cost every year for those that would like to go to our state parks. And of course, we always encourage you to make your way to our state parks, whether it's locally here in Oakland County, at places like Kensington, Metro Park, or others all across the state of Michigan. It's always a good time in our beautiful and, and varied parks all across the Great Lakes State. Also making headlines today on our local news page on civiccentertv.com from Kim Kozlowski at the Detroit News. Michigan State University's Board of Trustees has officially approved a $38 million plan for a multicultural center building soon to be placed on the northeast corner of Shaw and Farm Lane. And this is a great project to help students engage in the many different cultural, ethnic, and other backgrounds on campus at MSU, much like we have here in our local area. And even here in southeast Michigan, much like they'll soon have at MSU, there's a wealth of experiences and resources for you to explore cultures from across our local areas. We are really in a, a great melting pot within the state of Michigan. There's so many different cultures all across our state and, the, and really a ton of them here in our local area and plenty of places to explore those cultures, learn more about your neighbors and learn more about the great history of these many different cultures, uh, ethnicities and more right here in our local area from the Chaldean Cultural Center, another great location. You can go right up the street from us here at our flagship at Civic Center TV in West Bloomfield to, you know, if you're going down to the city, going to Detroit, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History is there as well, and the Arab American National Museum in Dearborn, among the many different places, museums, activity centers, cultural centers, and more that you can explore right here in our local area, whether it's in Oakland County or surrounding counties or in the more wider region of Southeast Michigan. There's so many great experiences for you and your family to learn more about your neighbors and experience different worldviews right here in our local area. So while the young adults at MSU will soon get their chance to expand their learning into theirs and other cultures, I challenge you to do the same. It's really amazing just how much you can learn about how much we all have in common and how much you know, we can learn from one another by just doing a little bit of exploration in the people that are maybe living a different lifestyle than you or have different life experiences and life histories than you as well. 
Finally making headlines on our local news page today on CivicCenterTV.com from MLive's Ryan Zook. Congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs for their big win last night in Super Bowl 57 over the Philadelphia Eagles. And that game also came with plenty of Michigan connections on the field, both on the champion's side as well as the runner-ups out of Philadelphia. Of course, Chiefs backup quarterback Chad Henney is a Michigan grad as well as uh, additional former Wolverines and alumni and defensive ends Frank Clark and Michael Dano. But we have even closer connections to on the world champs right here from our local area, from our local high schools. Midland High School graduate Andrew Wiley also earned a championship ring alongside the aforementioned Michael Dana, a graduate of Warren D. LaSalle. If you're watching on our streams or on our live TV show, you see a, a tweet from a really great organization here locally, the D Zone, that covers so many high school sports across Oakland County and around the state of Michigan, showing their pictures on there. Michael Dana and Andrew Wiley from Midland and Warren D. LaSalle High School. In case of Michael Dana, continuing his history of winning ways, D. LaSalle, of course, a powerhouse program here on the football side in southeastern Michigan and then goes on to the University of Michigan. They've had a lot of really good years in the recent past and of course now with the Kansas City Chiefs taking home a Super Bowl trophy last night. But the Philadelphia Eagles had no shortage of Michigan connections either from former Lions standout Darius Slay to additional high school grads playing in the big game on Sunday evening. Brandon Graham of the Eagles, of course another University of Michigan grad from Crockett High School locally, as well as Avante Maddox from Detroit King, another powerhouse of football here in southeastern Michigan, and Tyree Jackson from Mona Shores, all getting in-game action in uh, Tempe last night in the Phoenix area at Super Bowl 57. Congratulations to all of our local alums on their Super Bowl appearances, and of course those local Kansas City Chiefs on their championship victory last night as well. Way to represent the Great Lakes State gentlemen. Congratulations on another wonderful season. All those headlines are on our website today, making news on civiccentertv.com. Just click on our local news tab. We have a great show ahead on this Monday edition of the Megacast. Coming up next, we'll have a chat with State Senator Jim Runstead from White Lake. Stay tuned, that's coming up. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. Let's relish these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. I'm Steve Eisenman of the Detroit Red Wings, and I think every child in Michigan deserves a safe, healthy, and happy childhood. Can we build a state where children trust Michigan isn't just a name, but something our kids believe? Please support Children Trust Michigan as the voice for children and families by visiting the website to learn more. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. You can learn more about our program on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast, including direct links to all of our partnering stations on the TV side, on the radio side, as well as on the web from throughout Southeast Michigan and across the Great Lakes State, including our co-flagship at My Michigan TV. And find all of our full shows and each individual interview segment on demand as well. All of that, again, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Joining us now on the program is Senator Jim Runstead, a state senator from Michigan's 23rd district. Uh, senator Runstead, thanks for being with us today. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah, glad to have you on the show, of course, as, as we are well underway into a new Congress here in the state of Michigan, as we are at the federal level, and, and plenty already in, ha, has been in the works across both sides of the aisle in Lansing. So I just want to give you a moment here a, as we begin to talk about some of the things that you've been working on as of late in Lansing for our local area. 
Well, the uh, the primary thing that I've been working on is trying to get some reform, and I guess we're going to be talking about this today, of uh, CPS. And uh, another thing that I've been working on, actually since I got in office, is trying to get a fix for our problems with dyslexic students. Uh, Michigan is known to be the worst state in the nation for a dyslexic student. They uh, get absolutely no help. Uh, every other state does some kind of testing to find out which students are having problems with reading and then do early intervention. Michigan does not do that. And uh, it's been a, a struggle for year after year after year and hoping before I get out of office that we can get uh, some uh, movement on fixing this problem. And what sort of resources are you looking to you know, eventually get into legislation and get into law for Michigan to have in place for some of these students that may be struggling because of their dyslexia in the classroom and, and help them you know, get the, the help that they need in order to be at the same level they should be at amongst their peers in their classes? Well, there's a, a number of things. Uh, in the last couple of years, I was able to get a million and then $2 million into training for uh, teachers that were uh, struggling with how to teach their dyslexic students. And so we had two different entities. There were Michigan uh, organizations that did this kind of training, and it was going to be a pilot run. It was completely full. The teachers that went through it said it was spectacular. Uh, they uh, were, were so impressed with the advance that they made uh, personally and in their ability to help the students now and, and believe me that was just a drop in the bucket of the need and now i don't even know if that's even going to get through in this year's budget uh the uh the bigger uh, proposal that we had was i think seven bill proposals to teach uh, the uh, teachers coming out of universities how do you teach a dyslexic student uh, there is no work on that currently and uh, there's uh, the Orton Gillingham method is the best method uh, that's not being taught. Uh, most of the teachers were never taught uh, phonics today, and that's uh, critical for a dyslexic student to be able to learn. <clears throat> this bill was defeated um, uh, over the last two terms. Uh, I think it will be unfortunately defeated again. Uh, that means Michigan students will be the worst in the nation uh, again. Uh, we're, I think, uh, number 40 in the nation for uh, fourth grade reading. We spend a fortune. We pour millions and millions more into the programs every year and don't get results. In fact, the results get worse. And every time I talk about this issue, it falls on deaf ears. So it's just very frustrating. We're joined by Senator Jim Runstead, a Republican from White Lake, here on today's edition of the MAGACast, representing the 23rd District in the Michigan Senate. And Senator Runstead, uh, as we as we are talking about education and trying to help students uh, that, are, that are struggling in the classroom, uh, recently the Michigan Senate had voted to uh, dismantle par portions of the so-called third grade reading law that would then, uh, in this case, no longer require a student to be held back should they fa should they fall over a year behind their grade reading level. Give us your thoughts on this change to this law that was voted affirmatively by a 22 to 16 vote in the Senate last week. Yeah, I was very conflicted uh, when I voted for this initially, and the reason was we were hearing decade after decade that certain school districts, uh, Detroit was the most uh, prominent, were simply passing students on who are illiterate. They couldn't even read their own diplomas. And it, it would go on decade after decade. It was like, okay, well, there's not gonna be any work to help these students. And I've talked to students who were in that situation and said, you know, this is terrible. I can't even read. And now I'm expected to function in this society. So we thought there'd at least be some kind of, uh, you know, work on behalf of these students from the school districts. Uh, the numbers still are not improving. Uh, the total number of students that would have been held back uh, would be about 500 out of, I think, 128,000 students. So very, very small number. And I said, if we can put dyslexic training finally into the program, 
this is probably something I could support. But if you're not going to do anything for these students, there's no uh, penalty for educational systems passing students on illiterate and giving them a diploma, then something has to be done. So uh, again, it, if the people could see what happens in Lansing, we're the worst in the nation for dyslexia. They get no help. This has been known for years. We pour millions and millions of dollars into early uh, reading, but with no dyslexic training. Up to 20% of the students are dyslexic. We have the 40th worst outcomes in the nation. Uh, You'd think that there'd be the will to get this fixed, and there's no will. So I put in an amendment that we start teaching the uh, uh, the teachers coming out of universities about dyslexia. It was defeated. So it's it's just very, very frustrating. Yeah, all these investments being made in the education system are, are great, but they need to be, of, of course, wide-ranging for the wide range of students that we have here in the state of Michigan. Senator Runstead, going back to another issue that, that unfortunately uh, affects our children here in the state of Michigan, recently we had some uh, really sad news here uh, in our local area, a tragic situation in Lincoln Park uh, w w that involved uh, Child Protective Services and a dangerous situation that led uh, to some people actually losing their life in the process. And, and you had uh, raised your voice about some issues with transparency from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, which oversees Michigan's Child Protective Services. Uh, tell us about your experience working with local uh, constituents in, in this situation and how that shined light on some of the issues uh, that, you that you've now spoken out about with Child Protective Services. Yeah, my interest in this um, started decades ago my wife and i were foster care parents we would hear these horrible stories of kids being abused and returned and abused and returned i remember we were going through a training for foster care and one of the parents who was one of our trainers was saying that they had these uh, very young girls who had been raped and the this uh, foster care parent had them for a while. They went back to get raped again. She got them again. They went back to get raped again. She went, I was like, what? This is insane. I remember pounding my my hand on the table. I had to leave the room. I was so upset. I said, you mean they are raped and turn, returned? Yep. Um, so I tried finding out information on what was happening with uh, Child Protective Services for years and always the same answer. We can't tell you anything. So uh, I was not surprised when I was reading about two, two and a half weeks ago about a mother uh, with mental health issues, probably schizophrenia, who had three children, a 12, an eight, and a five-year-old, and they were wandering the streets of Pontiac in the freezing cold, and the kids just had some sheets wrapped around them. And she thought that everyone was trying to kill them, and uh, you know, like I said, severe mental health issues. and. Uh, she bedded the kids down in a field and then she and two of the kids uh, froze to death and the older uh, daughter ran to a home and survived and so i i wanted to know what interactions were there with cps so i called them they said well we can't tell you anything and i said that's what i've been hearing for you know 30 years you you can't tell anything well how are you know i'm a sitting uh, senator i uh, you can't tell me anything no so uh i started uh, uh, getting concerned that these cases never seemed to end. We got a new one cropping up every week or two. And I had them send me why they say they can't uh, disclose this information. They said it was state and federal law. Well, the federal law is very lax. It just says you can't uh, give a personal identifying information like the home address, that kind of thing. The state law is more constrictive and the only part of the legislature or media that can get any information is a committee that oversees the department. But the problem with that is, okay, the department is uh, head is appointed by uh, the governor and the governor obviously doesn't want to splash a bunch of negative news around. So a committee chair, who's also part of the same party as the governor, are they going to want to have a hearing and disclose all the bad news, make embarrassing their governor? No, they're not. So that was not going to happen. So I put in a bill that said any sitting legislator 
or uh, credential media can get this information and sit down with the file and find out what happened. But they have to uh, also uh, sign the same non-disclosure form, which is a 93-day uh, in prison and jail um, misdemeanor if they disclose the information. So the same protections are in place, but at least we can get an understanding of where the failures are within the system. So uh, that uh, uh, went to committee. I talked to the committee chair, and the committee chair said they're not going to have a hearing. And I said, why not? And they said, well, uh, probably wouldn't be good for the media to have this information. I said, well, it is. It's a misdemeanor uh, if they disclose, um, you know, but I'd be open if you want just the legislators to have uh, this opportunity. No, nope, no hearing. So we're back to square one. We're just like with the dyslexia, we're back again with this uh, issue of CPS to be crash and burn for decades longer. Um, no transparency, no disclosure, what went wrong. Uh, they just point to a aggregated data that's in the um, uh, auditing report. Well, that's just the sheer total numbers. It doesn't tell you where the failures were. So it's not going to have a hearing. Um, it, it, very, very discouraging. I think if the average citizen in the state of Michigan uh, peel the onion on this stuff. They go, what in the hell's going on? I mean, you, you we're the worst in the one of the worst in the nation on dyslexia. Well, actually, everyone says the worst, and we can't get any resources, anything to fix this. Nope. Uh, we have this terrible uh, DHHS has been under court order for its child uh, welfare since 2008. I believe it's the longest running federal case against a state about how uh, we're doing with this child welfare. You'd think that there'd be the will to fix it. Nope, no no hearing, no transparency, nothing. So it just seems these systemic issues for these children never, ever get fixed. Yeah, and it, and it was WDIV TV in uh, Detroit that had made a Freedom of Information Act request to the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services uh, over the CPS case regarding Monica Kennedy and her two sons, who were the individuals who were found dead in a, uh, frozen to death in a field in Pontiac in uh, mid to late January, and uh, uh, they were told that in the case the information was not available uh, as there was an exemption. And uh, then Governor Whitmer was even asked about this by by a local news organization and said that she quote didn't know that they that they were exempt from FOIA and perhaps there is opportunity for us to take a real hard look at it and see what more we can do. I know that at, uh, you mentioned at the committee level, uh, it, it's kind of been dragging their feet or a straight denial on any sort of changes to this. Has there been any discussion with the, with the governor's office or with her team about in interventions from the executive office? The, uh, uh, the chair of the committee that was assigned to, and she, she is the most involved governor in the legislature I've ever seen. Um, I personally believe from everything we can see, she seems to be running the entire legislature in the House and Senate. For her, with all the publicity associated with this, that this bill was gonna go to the committee, um, she could absolutely have talked to the committee chair and said, you're running the bill, and the bill would have run. Uh, I believe it was the opposite. I have met her people said, you're not running this bill. There's going to be no transparency uh, because I've got a lot of uh, political ambitions that are going to be really uh, put to the test if we rip open this can of worms and the people in the state of Michigan find out that uh, we're doing nothing to protect these kids. And uh, so it's back to square one. Everything's always back to square one. Uh, again, the people, if they uh, could see what happens so much in Lansing, they'd be grabbing their pitchforks and torches and, and be heading to Lansing uh, with a fury because things that should be absolutely at least have a hearing. Uh, let's find out what's happening. No, no hearing. We're joined on, on today's program by Senator Jim Runstead from Michigan's 23rd Senatorial District. Uh, out of White Lake. Uh, Senator Runstead, a couple more minutes with you before we'll have to say goodbye today. Anything else that you'd like to discuss or anything else that you uh, are working on that your constituents here in our local area should be keeping an eye out for in the near future? Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the courts, I think, are, are an area that the people of the state of Michigan really have to uh, pay attention to. And again, just like with the other issues, there's transparency issues with the court system. 
So there are counties in Michigan where you could go before the court and you have your proceeding and then the uh, the system says, uh, well, you can't have a copy of the proceeding. And they say, well, what do you mean I can't have a copy? No, we'll give you a transcript. Well, I've talked to attorneys who have said that they personally observe judges leaning over to the court reporter and saying, uh, don't put that in. So if you don't have a video in there, you're not going to know if stuff is left out of that transcript. Also, the way you say something on a, uh, you know, personally say something uh, versus what's in writing can be completely different. So I have been trying for years and years and years to say that every county that videotapes, and they all do now, I have to, at a decent cost, give the constituent, the, the person who was in the court in their room, a copy. And uh, Oakland County is one of the worst. They uh, don't give any videos. And when asked why, they said, well, we don't want to look bad on social media. Well, the Supreme Court of Michigan, they, they are taped, and you can get a copy of that tape. Every little local to the top uh, legislature, uh, all are videotaped, and you can see every proceeding. Why would one county or a couple of counties say, well, we don't want to look bad? I mean, it's public transparency. Uh, I'm concerned that they're concerned about looking bad. That's even more of a concern that we need to get this bill passed to get transparency for the people here in the state of Michigan. Um, again, it probably will never happen. Transparency, a major issue for those all across the political spectrum here in Michigan and around the United States. Senator Runstead, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Appreciate having you on. Senator Jim Runstead from Michigan's 23rd Senatorial District, a Republican out of White Lake. We'll take a, bre a break here on the Megacast. On the other side, it's been a really weird pattern of weather over the last couple of weeks from freezing cold temperatures and snow to sunny and 60 degrees over the weekend. What the hell is going on with Mother Nature here in Michigan and around the country this winter? Rich Pullman from the National Weather Service out of Detroit and Pontiac will join us next to talk about that and more on the Megacast. In the face of COVID-19, staying healthy is important. And now the same is true in the face of flu. Influenza has the power to infect millions. But it's easy to protect yourself, your family, and your community. The flu vaccine is safe and effective. And with COVID-19 still around, it's essential. Together, we can face flu season head on. Visit michigan.gov slash flu. Many people are feeling overwhelmed and struggling with mental wellness these days. So be kind to your mind. Give yourself permission to breathe. Share your feelings. You are not alone. Have hope. Talk to a Stay Well counselor for free confidential help 24-7 through the COVID-19 hotline. Ronnie started doing prescription pills at the age of 15 and by 19 he died. If your child is struggling with drug use, try not to be too proud to reach out for help. Don't be worried about what the neighbor will think or your family. Just get your child the help they need. Sometimes it's the hard road to take, but um, the hard road is nothing compared to living with the fact that your child is no longer with you. There's hope and help at drugfree.org. When you have a gambling problem, you have a money problem. Don't let your gambling cause you financial hardship. If you or someone you love is struggling with gambling, we can help. Get free confidential counseling and win your life back. Learn more at michigan.gov slash problem gambling. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. You can find more information on our show, including all of our partnering stations all across Oakland County and their original programming outside of the hour each day, five days a week during the week that we have 
our live show and live to tape with them on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll also find all of our full shows and each segment on demand as well. Joining us now on the megacast from the National Weather Service's Detroit Pontiac office is Warning Coordination Meteorologist Rich Pullman. Rich, thanks for being with us today. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Yeah, glad to have you on uh, at a really interesting time here in, in, in Michigan. This winter has been kind of on and off. It starts, it stops, it kind of putters along. And what started with a, a quite massive storm right before the holidays uh, kind of has had a, a pretty quiet overall season here and unseasonably warm at times, too. Is that something that was within the predictions and the forecasts for this winter from experts like yourself and others at the National Weather Service coming in? Or is this really an oddity of a winter here in Michigan? So, so far this winter, um, we were forecasting a La Nina winter. We have the El Nino cycle, we have a La Nina cycle, and we have something in between that we call neutral. And so with the La Nina winter, um, the storm track is through the Great Lakes. If that storm track is west of the Great Lakes, we get into a lot more of the warmer air. And we've seen a lot more of that weather pattern with this La Nina than any other uh, weather pattern. We've had a few breaks in that where the storm track, the jet stream, if you will, dipped far enough south that the Arctic air was allowed to encroach in on the Great Lakes. And that's what happened right before Thanksgiving, right around the Christmas holiday. And then that, uh, week or so around February 1st when we got our snowfall with that January 25th storm. But otherwise, it's been predominant with a storm track much further to the west, uh, heavy snowfalls for Iowa and Wisconsin and the UP while we're on the wet side of the storms when the storms roll through. And when you mentioned earlier on those cycles come through and this particular one puts us in sort of a, 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 a trend of warmer air in, in pockets throughout the winter, but this much warmer, Rich, where it's been, you know, when, when I think of warmer weather in the winter, I think of you know high 30s, early to mid 40s on the warmest side, but uh, you know, a few 50 degree days, a mid, six, uh, mid 60 degree day over the weekend also, how normal is that within this weather pattern? With the La Nina pattern, that certainly can happen, especially when you get the big storms rolling up through the western part of the Great Lakes. It pumps in a lot of that warm air with the south winds. The predictability of that early in the season in October when we issued our winter outlooks, uh, that predictability to have this kind of warmth is rather low. You're right. A lot of times when we have above average winters here in Michigan, it's a lot of 35 to 40 degree days with a lot of clouds and um, more recently, we've seen a lot of this uh, sunshine, uh, temperatures getting close to 50. Uh, that, that's a little bit more anomalous than what we would typically think with above average winter. But uh, it's something that we're seeing right now. And it looks like the trends are there for it to um, be there a little bit later this week. And then certainly into uh, next week, we have another chance for another warm up. Joined by Rich Pullman on today's edition of the MegaCast from the National Weather Service's Detroit Pontiac office. Uh, their warning coordination meteorologist on today's program. And, and uh, Rich, with that being the case, we know in, re in uh, recent weeks we have our yearly predictions for the extent of our winter from Punxsutawney Phil in, in Pennsylvania to Woody the Woodchuck here in Michigan, both with conflicting opinions on how much longer this winter may last. Based on the forecast we have and, and the weather pattern that we've been in this winter, should we be expecting things to be more consistently warm and getting to a kind of an early spring or you know, a resurgence of winter perhaps in the coming weeks and, and last couple months here? So as we look at our outlook, uh, we're looking at above normal temperatures through the month of February. Uh, and then as we look into March and April, it, it still looks like our, our temperature pattern is going to be uh, residing on the um, uh, uh, probably on the on the warmer side. We may actually see a little bit of a cooling, uh, but by the time we get to March and April, uh, something that's a little bit more normal is still going to be uh, well above freezing. Our average high on March 1st is 40 degrees, and uh, by the time we get to April 1st, it, it's about 53, 54 degrees. So even something that's a little bit closer to normal is uh, relatively spring-like and not uh, not necessarily our winter weather. That's not to say that 
much like we've seen this winter, you couldn't have a week of below normal temperatures and it run into a snowstorm in the month of March. That's very common even in the warmest of Marches. Uh, you know, you can look all the way back 50 years ago in uh, March of 73, and it was a very warm March, uh, but we had one snowstorm in there. That was a pretty significant St. Patrick's Day snowstorm. So we always have to have an eye out for winter weather, uh, be prepared for it as we go through the month of March, even though the bulk of the season looks like it's going to be above normal for that month. And look, it's a little bit warm. It's more of a warmer period than we're used to in a Michigan winter here, Rich. And uh, certainly when we think of those warmer days, we're thinking about the 40s or maybe the 50s, and now we're having them in the 60s. And so in today's, in today's world, you got to think about it too. How much of a factor perhaps is climate change in the swing to being much more warmer over the last in a couple of weeks when we've had those warm periods versus what a warm day in the winter has been in the past 10, 20 years? So when we look at uh, the individual season, it's hard to say that uh, climate change is responsible for this winter. Uh, to date, we're the eighth warmest winter on record for the Detroit area. But as I look at the records for the top 10, six of those 10 are in the last 25 years. That would be more of a signal of the climate change. That six of the top 10 warmest winters to date uh, on February through February 12th uh, have resided in the last 25 years. That is the, the fingerprints that we look for for climate change. This year falls into that, but this year itself uh, being um, a focus of the uh, warming planet you can't necessarily say that this pattern is because of that, but that 25 year pattern has all the year markings of it. And, and this is just rolled right into those other years that I'm looking at for the top 10 warmest winters on record. Yeah, we talk about climate change as a big old buzzword in um, a modern day, but it all comes back to you know, that basic middle school, high school science le lesson. Weather is what's been happening lately, and climate is over a number of years, and we've seen those differences over a number of years. Joining us on today's MegaCast is Rich Pullman, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist with the National Weather Service office out of Detroit Pontiac, located in White Lake. Uh, Rich, you have a really interesting job, and as we are going into... Uh, the, the, the tail end of the winter season, we head into spring and you know, from there go on to the summer season. We're right around that time of the year where we start to really be thinking about severe weather situations. And how does your job factor into providing those forecasts, those warnings and specifics on those for us in our local area here in southeastern Michigan? Yeah, we're about to turn the page. Um, you know, winter is, is still here. And like I said, we're still going to be paying attention to if we have that winter storm in the middle of March. But uh, we have uh, Skywarn Spotter Training uh, hosted by our local emergency management community across Southeast Michigan. And uh, we will present that. So if you're interested in becoming a trained weather spotter for the National Weather Service and your local community, uh, be sure to check out our website at weather.gov slash Detroit. Uh, right at the top, there's a link to our Skywarn training that starts on March 2nd. Uh, and so, uh, we're turning the page, getting ready for that severe weather. Uh, on March 19th is the start of Severe Weather Awareness Week, uh, where we'll be promoting uh, preparedness, safety activities. Then on Wednesday, March 22nd is the statewide uh, tornado drill, and it's really just a time to practice. Um, some communities may sound their sirens at one o'clock. We'll do our weekly weather radio test at one o'clock instead of at 11.30. And um, it's a time for schools and businesses and people at home to just practice and think about their severe weather safety plans. We do that in March before we really get into the meat of the severe weather season, which generally is May, June, July, and into August. We can get some severe weather in March and April, and so we do want to be prepared for that. It's that transition season where that can happen. but. Uh, we're, we're starting to get prepared for that severe weather season. Uh, that's just a couple of months away. And uh, we got a couple of activities coming up to help everyone get prepared and, and, and learn about it.
Yeah, we'll definitely reach out to uh, try to have you back on around that time to really go into more details about making those severe weather plans and how to best interpret on an individual level in your local area and on a wider level for a community uh, how to adjust to those in, uh, oncoming or warned or forewarned severe weather situations. But I do want to go back and talk to you more about uh, about the uh, Skywarn spotter, tra spotter training that, that's available. People can learn more about, again, the website being weather.gov slash Detroit. And at the top of the page, you just click on both in-person and virtual Skywarn spotter, tra spotter training cl uh, classes. Who are these available to and who can do this? Really, anyone can uh, participate. Um, we like to say uh, if you're teenage years or older, you can report to the Weather Service, but it's really open to anybody that wants to learn about severe weather, uh, how to look for certain parts of the storm that are more prone to severe weather, and then how to report to the Weather Service. The last piece that we teach in Skywarn, say, uh, Skywarn Spotter Training is that safety piece. Uh, the most important thing for all of our spotters is to remain safe uh, from the severe weather and then report that severe weather to the weather service to the local authority so that we can issue those warnings in a timely and accurate fashion. You help the weather service learn about severe storms, help us issue the next warning for the downstream community, and it it'll get, allows us to gather that data, the ground truth data. The satellites, the radar, give us a lot of the information. We can see hail in the storm. We can see some of the wind energy, whether it's rotating or not, but that's at the cloud level. That may be at one to 3,000 feet in the storm and the radar cannot see below the cloud level, below that 1,000 feet. So we need our spotters to give us the ground truth to say, hey, that hail, the hail storm that you see, uh, it's reaching the ground as golf ball size hail or the rotation that we're seeing in the cloud base has manifest into a funnel cloud or worst case scenario, a tornado. And so we need those spotters out there to give us that information so that we can issue the more accurate and timely warnings. And just how much of a difference does it make to have a number of these spotters spread throughout local areas, certainly on a county by county level, as that typically is where the National Weather Service will isolate those warnings to how much of a difference does it make in the accuracy from what you're able to forecast uh, with your team of meteorologists and other weather experts to making those warnings much more accurate and much more pinpointed? Well, it's a, it's a long iterative process actually, because we really try to have our warnings out before the severe weather is reported, that's the goal. Uh, and so then the spotter gives us reports of verification of that severe weather. But that's always a learning opportunity. Every severe thunderstorm, every tornadic storm offers us that opportunity to learn about it. And the spotters give us the information that corroborate with the radar data. And every little new piece of data is a learning opportunity so that the next severe thunderstorm warning, the next tornado warning can be even better. And so over the course of uh, 30 years that I've been in the weather service and uh, 50, 60 years of Skywarn spotters, uh, the warning process has gotten better each and every year to the point now where we can issue warnings ahead of 90% of all the severe weather with about a 20 minute lead time. Tornado specifically, we're issuing warnings ahead of the tornado about 70 to 75% of the time with a 10 to 15 minute lead time. And all of that is from advancements in technology, but a large part of it is also gathering those spotter reports so we can learn about the storm so that the next warning can be issued even more accurately and more timely for the citizens of Southeast Michigan. More information can be found on the spotter training program by going to the National Weather Service's local website, weather.gov slash Detroit, or for specific, uh, specifics on the training program directly, you can go to weather.gov slash DTX slash spotter2. For more information, spotter to the number two after the word spotter to go directly to that or simplest way, weather.gov slash Detroit and just look under news headlines at the top of the page to learn more information available for ages 13 and up. Joining us on the Megacast is Rich Pullman from the National Weather Service's Pontiac Detroit office, their warning coordination meteorologist. Rich, a few more minutes with you before we'll need to say goodbye today. Anything else uh, that we should be keeping in mind about the continuation of this? Uh, Odd on the outside looking in, but all, all uh, things being said, mostly normal for this weather pattern of a winter season or looking forward to future seasons here this year. 
Yeah, I think the big thing uh, for upcoming with our winter season is that uh, for the most part, the storm track uh, this uh, La Nina season has missed Southeast Michigan in, in general. I, we've had about average precipitation, but in a lot of La Nina winters, we get above average precipitation and the storm track is going to get a little closer to us, a little more active. So we have a, a few rain events coming up uh, on the backside and might have mix in with a little snow. We'll see if we get any sort of light accumulation out of that. But uh, it does look like we're going to get, get back into a little bit of an active pattern over the next seven to 10 days with more precipitation, mostly falling as rain. And so that is a trend that we see in the La Nina uh, uh, winters is that the storm track gets over us um, and the, uh, uh, especially in February and March. And so we're starting to see that pattern with more wetter conditions with storm track in the Great Lakes uh, region, and uh, that is uh, a La Nina footprint, and we're starting to see that, and something to look forward to in the next uh, week, certainly, but maybe into the month of March. Well, Rich, we appreciate your insight on this and, and kind of clearing up some of the confusion that may be out there. Certainly I had, and maybe those out in our listening and watching audience had as well on our winter season. And of course, always looking forward and being prepared for severe weather season that's not too far away. Thank you, Rich. Oh, you're welcome. Happy to join in this morning. Glad to have you with us. As always, you can find more information, keep up to date on our local weather, as well as their that, that great Skywarn spotter training classes available through the National Weather Service on their website, the local website, weather.gov slash Detroit. We'll take a brief break here on the Megacast. On the other side, we'll go over some of our resources available on our website and talk to you about some of our great partnering stations and their original programming. Stay tuned. This is the Megacast. Watch Civic Center TV with our brand new live captions. To turn on live captions, go to civiccentertv.com and click Watch Live. In your web browser, Click on the Options tab in the top right and find the Accessibilities tab. Then just switch on live captions to heighten your enjoyment of our local programming. Thank you so much for watching Civic Center TV. When the temperatures are chilly, being together warms the soul. <laughs> Keep the winter fun going. Help protect yourself and those around you by keeping your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine to keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. One in four Michigan homes has high levels of radon, a naturally occurring radioactive gas known to cause lung cancer. It doesn't matter where you live or what type of home you have. You won't even know it's there unless you test. So don't wait. Testing is cheap and easy and if there's a problem, it's simple to fix. Visit michigan.gov slash radon to learn more. We took action, will you? I'm feeling good. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. My Michigan TV is streaming everywhere on Apple TV, Roku, Fire TV, and more smart TV apps. My Michigan TV is on your phone too. Take us with you wherever you go. Just search for My Michigan TV on your favorite app store or visit mymitv.com. All Michigan, streaming everywhere. My Michigan TV.
Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. You can stay up to date with us on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. You'll find all of our full shows and each individual interview segment on demand and more information about all of our partnering stations across the Oakland County area and, and around the state of Michigan. And this is a really great place to go to learn more about what's going on in your original in uh, your community outside of our show here, our proper show Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. live, as well as live to tape in certain communities on our network across the county and around the state of Michigan. You can really learn more about what's going on in your specific area from these different resources. They do a lot of what we do here at Civic Center TV at our flagship for the greater West Bloomfield communities in isolated areas all throughout Oakland County. Our, our friends over at Orion Neighborhood Television do a lot of work in the northern Oakland County area and Orion Township and in Lake Orion. Uh, same thing with our friends just a little ways down the road in Waterford at the Media Network of Waterford exploring all the fun and information and intrigue in Waterford with original programming all throughout the day and, and throughout the evenings as well and weekends also. That you can learn about your community and engage with your community and, and much like a like what we have here at Civic Center TV, they are also very apt to have participation in their programming from those of you out in, in their community. And many of these stations include public access services as well, so like Orion Neighborhood Television uh, has the public access wing uh, of their station, same thing in the media network of Waterford that allows you to kind of get an inside look and if you've ever been interested in television production or if you have an idea for a local show or you know you want to have your own talk show and talk to people in an area of your community whether it's your local library or your, your local optimist club or you know just another club of interest maybe you know as I mentioned earlier on our headline seg segment when I was talking about our local parks pickleball has been on the rise all across the, st the state of Michigan and around the country it's a booming sport and maybe you know you got a lot of pickleball enthusiasts in your local community that want to talk about the game and the growing game and the growing community around the game in your community this is all possible through stations right in your local area, your community television and radio stations, your public access wings of those stations too. So you want to go to our website on civiccentertv.com slash megacast and click on the station for your local area, whether it's on the TV side, the Media Network of Waterford, Orion Neighborhood Television, Birmingham Area Municipal Access, who joins us live to tape. That's all right there. And such great work being done by local students as well on 88.1 The Biff, our radio partner on the show each and every day live from 10 a.m. To, to 11 a.m. Monday through Friday. They have students doing original programming five days a week, at least one shift per week for a two-hour show. And some students who are so daring to do multiple shifts throughout the week as they're you know, engaging in their school life, going to, the, to, to classes, participating in sports and other activities in their community, working in their jobs, getting ready for higher education or for going into the workforce after they graduate. And they're doing all this great original programming on a number of different topics. They have international programming as well and multi multilingual programming as well that happens on the weekends. A lot of really good stuff they're doing there. So again, go to our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you can explore all of this information, whether it's in your hometown or in one of your neighboring communities, or you just have an interest and some of the great local programming that's being produced right here in Oakland County, where we originate our broadcast. And while we have about 45 seconds left in the program, I also encourage you to go to our local news page to keep up to date on everything that's happening in Oakland County and throughout the state of Michigan on a on a day to day basis. Before our shows, we post articles that are the, the top stories for the day, and I'll try to connect them as best as we can to our local community as well and show how, how they apply here in Oakland County and statewide on a variety of levels. And we have health and human services information from the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division on, of course, COVID-19 still going on around our community, still spreading throughout our communities, albeit not at as severe of a level. Flu and other public health information also available directly linked to those resources, civiccentertv.com on our local news page. That will do it for today's show. Big thank you to both of our guests, Senator Jim Runstead and uh, Rich Pullman from the National Weather Service out of Detroit, uh, the Detroit Pontiac office, as well as our dedicated crew at My Megan TV, Jared Clark, and our director at Civic Center TV at Master Control today, Calvin Brown. Big thank you for joining us. That'll do it for today's Megacast. We'll be back soon with a new episode.